Hi there. So right now we're going to be looking at chapter 22.2 .2, which is forces acting on a moving charge in a magnetic field. So if you remember from last time, I said that in a magnetic field with a moving charge, you will cause movement. And that's just um, the other side we looked at before. Uh, the key word you have to look at here is moving. If you have, say, a stationary proton inside a magnetic field, nothing will occur. So that's really the key difference here. Alright, so let's take a look. Um, let's pretend we have a magnetic field here. So, um, by the way, um, in case you haven't noticed this, uh, haven't seen this before, these are vector notations. Um, and the easiest way to think about this is as if it was an arrow. So, an arrow that looks like this is a three dimensional vector, uh, is how we draw vectors in three dimensions. If you're looking at the arrow going out of a page, um, I mean, into the page, you'll look at it, you'll, look, you'll be seeing the end of the tail, so you'll ha appear to see a cross. If it comes straight out of the page towards you, you'll see the arrow that looks like this. So, these things here is basically drawing arrows into the page, and I'm just trying to show the direction of a magnetic field right now. But anyway, okay, so let's pretend that I have, say, a proton. And it's about, I fire a proton through, and it's going to and it's going to enter the magnetic field and it's like that. So there's my proton. And it has a velocity in that direction. And here's my magnetic field here. Coming out of a page. So what direction will this proton move? Well we've already been familiar with this. If you remember Fleming's left hand rule which we just looked at, which I will bring up again for you. Like sorry, like this. Fleming's left hand rule, right? Okay, so let's take our middle finger and point it in the direction of a current. That is in the direction of a positive charge. Make sure if at, this is the direction of conventional current. So if you're dealing with electrons, you have to point your finger in the other direction. That is, if an electron is moving from left to right, the direction of a current is from right to left. It can be still considered a current even if it's only just one proton moving. So, so let's put our middle finger in the direction of left to right, our magnetic field pointing into the page, and you'll see your thumb is pointing upwards. So, here we go. You should notice that as soon as it enters, it will experience an upwards force. But let's take a look at what really happens. As it goes upwards, it experiences a force, and then it will start turning upwards. But okay, let's consider a proton again at this point. Okay, um, let's take our gain, let's take our middle finger, point it across, and uh, in the direction of a uh, velocity, which has now become this. Uh, let's point our middle finger into the page, which is the direction of magnetic field, and our thumb will now be pointing this way. Uh, and again, over, and that will cause the direction to shift again. If you, what you'll notice, if you're observant, is that the direction of force is always acting in 90 degrees to the um, movement of a particle. So, what does that mean? Well. This is a little bit familiar, if you remember uh, what we've talked about in centripetal force. Basically, if a proton enters a magnetic field at um, right angles, here we go, I'll just draw it again for you. So I'm just going to draw a little bit to save time. So there's a magnetic field. The proton entering will always have a force acting 90 degrees to it. And if you remember, that's our definition of what centripetal force is. It will cause this proton to move in a circle continuously. So, given that the magnetic field is large enough that it can make a complete turn around before it exits the magnetic field, we can actually trap protons, or any charged particle, in fact, inside a magnetic field. And this will theoretically just go in circles forever, forever, if the proton is moving 90 degrees. Um, if you remember, this this here just comes from our. So, if you so predict the direction, so that, that's what we just did with our Fleming's left hand rule. So now um, this part here, recall and solve problems using f equals bqv. Alright, so this is, it seems re relatively simple. Um, it's this, if you remember our original equation, which is our kind of our grand equation for all magnetic fields, it was this, right? V cross product b. So I'm just going to quickly recount over what this vector uh, what cross product actually means. So this means that the direction of a force vector, the actual force vector v f, equals the charge q, which is a scalar quantity, doesn't really matter, times 
the, the magnitude of vector v uh, times the magnitude of vector b times a unit vector in, a, in the third direction, that is, the direction away from a page. And the magnitude of f is just, oh, sorry, there's a sign theta in here as well. And the magnitude of the force, so this was the whole vector of the force, including magnitude and direction. And the magnitude of the force is just all this, uh, just not regarding the unit vector, but that wouldn't matter anyway. So, this is basically BQV, which is what you see here, BQV sine theta. It's the same thing as we saw before. But let's relate it to an equation we had before. I know I already proved it the other way around, but let's go backwards and see if we can prove it again. So in the last one, we learned that uh, F equals B I L sine theta. And remember, we saw this is because I is just Q over T, and L over T is V, so that's Q, V, T again. But anyway... Let's try to prove this again. So, if we have this formula here, what happens? What is i? i is really the, the total number of equals or overall charge. Sorry, equals the overall charge divided by the time over in which that charge moves. So, overall charge at passes the point divided by the time that it took to pa the charge to pass. The overall charge is not normally just one huge charged particle that has a lot of charge in it. Normally, it's a lot of small charged particles, each one with its own individual uniform charge, for example, protons or electrons. So this is nq. So this little q means the charge of each particle, which should be the same, and n is the total number of charges. So uh, let's take a look again. And then if you just substitute that back into a formula, we get b, f equals b. Um, cameras doesn't like to deal with vectors like I showed you before, but I mean, they're really all the same thing. Sorry, fix that up. B N Q over T L sine theta. Fantastic. So, as you've just seen here, um, we have this formula. And now L over T, what do we know that is? That is, in fact, V. So this is a force acting on all the charged particles within a uh, within a system, which we're which inside a magnetic field, it, as long as they're all moving, because as you see, v n q v sine theta, as you see that there's a v in here. So if, obviously, if they aren't moving, they won't have they won't have any force acting on them. Um, but basically, if we're just considering one charged particle, n equals one, so that's f equals b q v sine theta. So that's where it comes from, really. So let's come back to the equation, and then we can see. Uh, let's do an example. So here's my magnetic field again. And here's my charged particle entering. And say I have, say a proton. A proton is going, going to enter this field. Okay, my proton's entering. And my proton's moving at, let's say 10% of the speed of light. So that's 3 times 10 to the power of 7. And let's say the magnetic field it's experiencing is 3 tesla. Okay, so now we have f equals b q v sine theta. We know b, we know v, uh, sine theta, let's say it's acting perpendicular to the magnetic field. Uh, but now we have this problem where we don't know q or f. So in order to find out the force, we need to know the charge, right? Well, we do know the charge of this proton. Um, but, uh, it is, in fact, the elementary charge. Uh, so, in case you don't know what elementary charge is, it's very easy to find out. What we have to do is go on Google and search up an elementary charge. So here we go. Here's what I got from Google. The elementary charge is 1.6021746. And um, this is enough to give me my force. So let's go ahead and calculate my force, okay? So, okay. So um, let's take a look. F equals BQV sine beta. So B is, we know, is 3 Tesla. So let's go 3 times... Q is 1.6021746 times 10 to the power of negative, I believe, 19. Times the velocity, we see this moving at 10% of the speed of light, so that's times 3 times 10 to the power of 7 sine theta, which is equal to 1. 
So we won't worry about that. So let's press equals and likely we should see that the result is 1 times 10 to the power of negative 11. That is not a lot of force. That is less than 1 newton, uh, 1 nanonewton. So that's, you might think, well, this magnetic field is really, really quite weak. Uh, let's write that down. 1.4 times 10 to the power of negative 11. So force equals 1.4 times 10 to the power of negative 11. And that is really not a lot of force, as you might know. And that's acting at 90 degrees to its velocity, straight upwards, as we saw through Fielding's left-hand rule. Uh, so, that's not a whole lot, but if you have to realize that this does not have a lot of mass, because this is mass time acceleration. So, this mass of a proton is also ridiculously small. So, this actually does produce quite a lot of acceleration. I mean, let's take a look. What is the mass of a proton? Mass of a proton is only 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 27. Negative 27. So if we go ahead and divide this number by the, our force, we should get acceleration, right? I'm sorry, if we divide our force by this number, we will get our acceleration. So 1.4 times 10 to the power of negative 11 divided by that number. And we have... My bad. 10 to the power of negative 27. I'll just fix up my equation here. So if we do that, we should see that acceleration is actually to the power of a magnitude 15. So this is actually quite a strong magnetic field. Um, but what you might have found really interesting is that we managed to work out the force acting on this particle by knowing its mass and its charge. And because and we can set the magnetic field, and we can also set the, uh, the velocity. So, you might wonder, what if we could set the velocity and magnetic field of unknown particles and figure out the mass to charge ratio? And that is exactly what we are able to do. You might have seen pictures like this. And then, scientists spend millions and millions of dollars creating these kind of random sprays, and they say, this changes everything, we've discovered new particles. And you might just look at it and see random scribbles and lines and circles. But what's important is that these circles, the radius of these circles shows a lot, and I'm going to show you why. Because from just the radius of a circle, you can work out what the mass to charge ratio of a particle is, and by that you can find out a lot about particles, in fact. So, let's take a look. Uh, let's put our two formulas together. Now we know that F equals BQV sine theta. And let's just ignore the sine theta for now because let's uh, it's, uh, pretend it's going 90 degrees. But we also know that there's a formula for centripetal acceleration, which is MV squared over R. So what if we put these two together? So if we said BQV equals MV squared over R. So what does R equal? R equals mv squared over b q v, but, but these v's cancel out, so that means we get m r equals mv over b q. So r equals mv over b q. But what you also might remember is I said we are able to control the magnetic field as well as the velocity of the particles. So what if we take those two out of the equation and we put, put them as a constant k, because we can control that. So, r equals m over q times k, which is just a constant, because that's v over b, which we can control. So, through the, through the radius circle, we can find out the mass to charge ratio of this particle, which is really quite important. And we can find out amazing new things about these particles through just this very simple thing. So, um, I mean, this is how you can find out the mass of an electron and the mass of a proton if you know its charge. So, back in Milken's oil drop experiment, they found out what the elementary charge is on an electron. And then, if you put it through a collider and watch the circles, you'll be able to figure out its mass. So, I believe that's, so that's how genius this thing is. It's really, it's really subtle things in physics that can really lead to amazing discoveries. So... Uh, basically, I think that's all we need to know about um, force on a moving charge. So as long as you know that F equals BQV sine theta, it can use it. And keep in mind that it is it does produce circles in a magnetic field, and it does produce centripetal acceleration. So you do have to equate it to F equals mv squared over R. And remember um, Fleming's left-hand rule, and we should be good. Thanks for listening.